in some of the best stories, places become more than just backdrops for the action. They become characters themselves. Unyielding mountains, unpredictable seas, and in the story of Christmas, a tiny town that birthed Israel's greatest king and the king who was yet to reign. David's birthplace was so insignificant that it could easily have been lost to history, swallowed up by Jerusalem just five miles away. But God made a promise to this little town through Micah, the prophet. Bethlehem, God said, you are smaller than most of the towns in Judah, but from you will come for me a ruler over Israel. So little Bethlehem waited, ready for the birth of her second king, the promised one of God. Well, good morning. It is great to have you worshiping with us here at Faith Bible Church. Excited to have you with us this morning. We are going to be looking at a couple of passages out of Scripture. But first and foremost, I want to say, don't know about you, but we are kind of in the process of preparing for Christmas. And when we recognize the preparation for Christmas, a lot of that is materialistic. It is, do we have the Christmas tree up? Do we have the decorations together? Do we have the presents ready to go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And one of the things that I would encourage us in as we have been in the Advent season is to realize that really Advent is about preparing our hearts for the arrival of the Messiah. Each Sunday, we go through a process of recognizing what it means to have our God with us, or our Emmanuel, and to be blessed in the fact that we have a Savior from which we worship. But one of the other things that I would say is this, oftentimes at Christmas, which is good, but somewhat incomplete, we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Now, I know you're looking at me and you would say, well, what is wrong with just celebrating the birth of Jesus? There's nothing wrong with it. But for those of you that maybe have a memory from last year, I will say the following statement. And I will walk over here this morning. And I love this time of year. Because the reality is, you can't have Christ without the cross. But you, you can't have the cross without Christ. The two go hand in hand. And the joy that we celebrate is what we talked about last week, which is the hope of a Messiah who leads us out of our sin and to the eternal kingdom. This morning we're talking about the aspect of the love of God. And my prayer for all of us is, is as we think through what the deep love of God is, and we reflect on that statement that you, you cannot have Christ without the cross, but you can't have the cross without Christ, we would realize the true aspect of what we celebrate at Christmas. So this morning, we're going to start off, and I have just a question. Is the purpose of Christmas just to celebrate the birth of Christ? And that's an important question for us to realize. My prayer is, is that after this morning, we realize that, yes, we do celebrate the birth of Christ. But what I want to tell you is this. If we just celebrate the birth of a baby in a manger, and we don't know who that baby is, but we also don't recognize the mission of that baby, then Christ's birth, like any other, while beautiful, is what? Just another birth. And so this morning, what I want to tell you is this. We're going to look essentially at what was just stated back in the video. We're going to look back to a passage in Micah, and then we're going to look forward to the resultant passage in Luke. 
And the joy in this is is we're going to see the blessedness of God's sovereign plan throughout history to bring about redemption for mankind through our Lord and Savior Jesus. One of the things that I'll start off by saying is this. George Whitfield, uh, an Anglican pastor and an evangelical preacher back in the Great Awakening, says this about Jesus. He says, Jesus was God and man in one person. A deep theological truth that cannot be and will never be distorted or changed. But what I love is the follow-up. Jesus was God and man in one person that God and man might be happy together again. What is that statement all about? Well, we're going to discover that obviously Jesus was eternal, yet Jesus was born and existed on earth, was both God and man, came to this earth not to be a ruler of his day, but to be the ruler of an eternal kingdom. And the manner of how Jesus would do this is he would go to the cross and die upon it as a sacrifice for our sins so that we might have eternal life. The statement that is made that God and man might be happy together again goes all the way back to the beginning of the story of the gospel, the Bible. That man was separated from sin in the Garden of Eden and that God's plan was to drive man back to a state of righteousness through our Lord and Savior Jesus. But in order to do so, Christ had to come, be born, and then die on the cross. And so friends, today what I want to tell you is, is while we celebrate the birth of Jesus, while we celebrate Christmas, and it is a joyous time, and we look to the manger, don't ever forget that behind the manger or above the manger is the cross. But then also don't forget that behind the cross is the resurrection. And don't ever forget that behind the resurrection is the second coming of our Savior Jesus. It all goes hand in hand. So this morning, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to turn to Micah. We're going to be looking at Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And to lay a little bit of context, what I'd like to do is is just let you know that very similar to last week, Micah is a prophet back in the Old Testament time. And what's happening is... Israel, the nation of Israel, God's people, have chosen essentially to kind of do their own thing. God has said, if you do this, I will be with you, I will bless you. God has made unconditional promises, but unfortunately Israel isn't following the conditional ones. And because of that, God is going to say, essentially, what's going to happen to you is you are going to go through a hard time. God's people are going to be divided. They're going to be conquered. You're going to be placed in exile. It's not going to be a pretty time. And that's essentially the theme of the first four chapters of Micah. It's a dark place. And then we get to Micah 5. And this is what I want to encourage you in. He says, brothers and sisters, even though it's a dark time and even though you have sinned and there are consequences for it, I have promised you that I will bring you a deliverer. I have made that promise. I intend to keep that promise no matter how or what you do. And I want to pause there for a minute because first and foremost, this is a prophecy specifically made to God's people at that time about the Messiah. But I think for us at times, we can recognize in our lives that while this is specific to this aspect, how many of us come and come with a feeling of being unworthy? Come with a feeling that perhaps maybe the sins in our lives are too big to actually be worthy of sitting in the chair that you're seated in. And friends, what I want to tell you is this, that lovingly, while I'll tell you that there are consequences for our sins, Christ always has forgiveness for them. And Christ came so that we might be forgiven. And so the first thing I want you to recognize before we dive into this passage is if you have or are suffering consequences for your sin, my prayer would be that you turn to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. And you recognize the blessedness of the forgiveness that is there. But also remember the promise of God. Because what's interesting is, if we look back historically speaking, God said things are going to get bad. Things are going to get hard. And they did. 
and they got really, really bad. But as we read in this passage, God said, but I'm going to bring you a deliverer. So let's pick up real quick. We're going to look at Micah 5. We're going to read the first couple of verses. It says, Marshal your troops, a city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace." Friends, this is a prophecy made by Micah hundreds, centuries before Jesus came. And what we have to understand and remember is recognize that Israel's time and the nation of Israel was in great turmoil. The nation was going to be essentially captured. The individuals were going to be placed in exile. And it wasn't going to be a good time for God's people. But God said, I want you to know that I have promised a ruler for you who will come out of Bethlehem, and he will establish a kingdom far greater than you can possibly imagine. And so the first thing that I want to show us is this, is while we look at the aspect of Christmas and celebrating the birth of Christ, what we learn from this passage is essentially because of Israel's sin and rebellion, dark times would come to God's people. That's the first aspect of the chapters prior to the statement that we see in Micah 5. But don't forget this, but because of God's faithfulness, his promises remain true, and he promises to bring a Savior out of Bethlehem. He says, I will bring you a Savior out of Bethlehem. That will happen. And the reason that I'm pausing here for a minute is to help us understand that oftentimes God makes a promise. And what do we expect? Immediate deliverance, don't we? We're we're not a society. People are not someone who will wait. And oftentimes when God makes a promise and what? We don't see that promise come to fruition. What do we do? We begin to doubt God, don't we? We begin to get doubt if God is really there, if God really cares. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is, is what I want to tell you is, is that as things progressed for the people of God after this statement, things got really, really bad. The nation was destroyed. God's people were placed in exile. And it wasn't a day. It wasn't a week. It wasn't a decade. It wasn't a century. It was hundreds of centuries. To the point that over time, the statement made by Micah had begun or was most likely completely forgotten. Really? That was said? It's been over 700 years and nothing has happened. Can we trust God? Can we trust his plan? Can we trust what he's going to do? Because I'm looking around and things haven't gotten better. They've gotten worse. We don't even remember who we are anymore. We don't know what we are and where, what, what we're supposed to do. And God said this through Micah hundreds of years ago, that he would bring out this ruler from this obscure town, Bethlehem. Do we even remember And time goes on and on and on. And little by little, in the hearts of the world, the promise of God becomes forgotten. And then one day. What good comes out of Bethlehem? What good comes out of a little town, completely obscured, 
not on the radar, not on the map of the political scene and the dominance of what's going on in the world during Jesus' day. To help contextualize friends, and I hope that you understand, in today's modern world, if we were essentially looking for Jesus, the eyes of our country would be on where? Washington, D.C. What ruler will come out of Washington? What individual will rule the nation and bring about the righteousness that is there? And it's as if the ruler comes out of Panora. Or better yet, Guthrie Center. <laughs> or, so that the Guthrie Center people aren't mad at me, Casey. <laughs> or, so the people aren't mad at me from Casey, I don't even know what other town, okay? <laughs> the point that I'm making is that the king would come out of such an obscure and unknown place. But what we find is, is it's the exact place that the sovereign God has said. And that's what I want to show you this morning. We look at Micah, we look at the promise, we realize that things go wrong, we realize that a lot of people think that God has abandoned them, that perhaps there is no God, that perhaps the promises of God are not true, that perhaps God has balked on what he said, perhaps that he's made a promise that he intends not to keep. And yet God says, I will bring you a ruler out of Bethlehem. Period. And that's where we find ourselves as we turn to Luke chapter 2. If you have your Bibles with you, that's where I'd like us to go. And we celebrate the joy of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. But what I want to do for you this morning is this. I love reading the Christmas story. I love going through Advent and seeing about the birth of Jesus. But as you do, what I want to encourage you in is look at the depth of what's going on here realize that there is so much behind the words that are given by Luke or the other gospel writers discussing the birth of Jesus. And the biggest thing that I'll show you in a minute is to realize that as the world thinks it's haphazard, as the world looks at it as insignificant, what we see is the sovereign hand of God leading, guiding, and directing, completing his promises, and bringing about the redemption of mankind through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We go to Luke chapter 2, the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He then went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The birth of Jesus is told carefully by the account of Luke. Friends, what I want to tell you is this, that as we turn to Luke chapter 2, we have to recognize this next aspect, that centuries later, almost forgotten, if not completely forgotten, God's plan of salvation unfolds as Jesus is born. Please don't miss that. Because we have the blessedness of being essentially on this side of the birth, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We know that. We know that that's happened. That's a blessed thing that we have. But here's the thing that I want to show you in this. I've said before, and this is what I want to kind of drive deep into our hearts, is that you cannot have Jesus or Christ without the cross but you can't have the cross without Christ. And where I'm going with this is, is that while we celebrate and know that Jesus has born, has died, these people were anticipating the arrival of the Messiah, the promise of the coming of Jesus. And centuries went by and people began to doubt, is this really true? 
while we know that Jesus has been born, where are we in the redemptive story of God's plan? Well, we're waiting for Jesus to come again. And it's been even longer from when Micah said that the Messiah would be born than Jesus died and declared that he would come again. And sometimes in our hearts and in our minds, we might begin to doubt. We might begin to wonder and say, gosh, it's been so long. Is that really going to happen? Is that really going to occur? I mean, I know it was said. I know we read it in scripture, but holy cow, it's been 2,000 years. Is Jesus really coming back? And friends, what I want to encourage you in, just as we see here, As Micah said that he would bring a savior out of Bethlehem and the world doubted, the next thing we know, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And so friends, the other thing that I want to tell you as we celebrate Christmas, as we look to the second coming of Jesus, whenever that might be, don't ever doubt that God has said, I will come again. And the joy and the blessedness of the hope that we share of our salvation and the opportunity to be with him in his kingdom. As we travel back and we reflect on what was stated by Keith last week in the message of hope coming out of the text of Isaiah chapter 9. It all goes together. And so we look at the love that is displayed and we realize that as Jesus is born as an infant babe being fully God and fully man we realize that here is someone who is held by his creation, yet is creator of that creation. That's the joy of the gospel. That's the blessedness of what we share. So the first thing that I want to say again is is that centuries later, almost forgotten, God's plan of salvation unfolds as Jesus is born. And so we see, essentially that Caesar Augustus is issuing a decree. But what I want to show you, particularly this, is this aspect. Why the decree? What's going on there? What's happening? Now think about this in the modern context of Jesus' day. It would be essentially as if the current president said, we're going to do a census on where our people are, how many people we have, what, quote unquote, the nation of America is all about. So Caesar Augustus from Rome says, I want to understand, quote unquote, my kingdom. And in order to do that, I'm going to have everyone go to the town of where essentially the patriarch was born and be, and then we're going to take numbers and then I'm going to get them and I'm going to understand how great I am. And the world's kind of going, okay, Caesar is king, Caesar is Lord. And so they go and they do a census. And I often wonder, this is just speculation, but I often wonder what was Joseph thinking as he traveled from Nazareth up to Bethlehem. Interestingly enough, if you look at that, you read in the text that they said they went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee Well, Bethlehem sits at about 2,300 feet above sea. So it was a trek up to get to Bethlehem. And here they are, and they're worrying about, obviously, the coming of an infant child and the inconsistency that is there. They're moving. They're displaced. They're placed out of their comfort zone. And I wonder if they were sitting there grumbling about God. And yet, friends, what we realize is this. While the world thinks that Caesar is the one who is behind the decree, God is the one who is over Caesar, making Caesar issue the decree. Don't ever forget that. The world looks at Caesar as the leader, and yet God is the leader of Caesar. And he is sovereignly putting into place that decree so that the Messiah can be born in Bethlehem, authenticating the prophecy that had been foretold centuries earlier. That's the sovereignty of God. 
And so that's what I want to show you is unknown to the world, God controls history so that the Messiah is born in Bethlehem. He does it through a decree through the most powerful man of the day, Caesar, the great Roman Empire. And Caesar, in his power and in his might and in his authority, looks around and he says, I am so big, I want to know how big I am, and I want to know who my subjects are so that I know my kingdom. And God says, go ahead, Caesar, because my kingdom is the eternal one. And so, friends, what I want to tell you this morning is, is as we look around the world and as we celebrate Christmas and we look to the happenings of the world, don't ever forget God's hand is behind everything. God's sovereign hand is leading, guiding, directing, and moving. And that's the joy that we celebrate at Christmas. Albert Moeller, in The Conviction to Lead, he was the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, says this about God's sovereignty. What does it really mean to affirm God's sovereignty? It means that God rules over space and time and history. It means that he created the world for his glory and directs the cosmos to his purpose. It means that no one can uh, truly thwart his plans or frustrate his determination. It means that we are secure in the knowledge that God's sovereign purpose to redeem a people through the atonement accomplished by his son will be fully realized. God's plan will be realized. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. When we look around, when we wonder and we think, what is the world coming to? Is God there? Does God care? We look to the birth of Jesus and it's a blessed time where hopefully, prayerfully, we take a moment and we pull back and we reflect on the joy of our Emmanuel or God with us. But also, friends, what I want to encourage you in, as I've said before, when we look at the manger, when we look at Jesus, please always remember that you cannot have the cross without Christ, but you can't have Christ without the cross. Jesus came on a mission, and that mission was what? To go to the cross on our behalf. So that dying as the perfect sacrifice that we celebrate at Good Friday and rising from the grave that we rejoice in in Easter, our sins, our separation from God could be, quote unquote, atoned for or paid for because of what he did. We celebrate that on Easter, realizing that indeed by placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we can have eternal salvation with him. But we also know that Jesus not only has done so, he has gone and is now seated at the right hand of the Father and has promised to come again. And so we wait in anticipation of Christ's second coming. It all goes together. And Christmas is one of the highlights of the gospel story that we recognize and understand through the Holy Scriptures. Unknown to the world, God controls history so that the Messiah is born in Bethlehem. I love the fact that the world is looking, and most likely everyone is thinking that Caesar's doing his thing, that he is the one that is working and creating and making all of these things happen. And yet, God is over Caesar. And interestingly enough, if we were to sort of modernize today, all the newspapers, all of the things, all of the people are probably looking where? To Rome for the greatest highlights, for the news of the day, for the events of what's transpiring. Or better yet, perhaps maybe they're looking to a bigger, larger city, perhaps Jerusalem, during Jesus' day. And here's Bethlehem a modern-day Panora, Guthrie Center, or Casey. And that's where the Messiah comes from. Insignificant to the world 
yet wholly significant to our eternity and to the kingdom of God. What a blessing it is to recognize what God is doing. We look and then we see, we get to the fact of the, uh, verse 7 and it says, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And that's essentially the start, which is the final point of what I want to speak to today, which is this, that Christ's birth starts Jesus' mission to bring salvation to all mankind. The joy that we celebrate at Christmas is the birth of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Yes, it is a beautiful story. It is a wonderful thing. We rejoice in the infant babe. We rejoice in Emmanuel or God with us. But please remember what I said before. If Jesus was born and Jesus just died and there was no cross, there was no atonement for our sin, if his birth was one among millions or billions, insignificant, we would not be here today. The cross laid behind the birth. The cross was Jesus' mission. The cross was Jesus' purpose. And interestingly enough, and this is one of the great theological conundrums of our day, is when did Jesus know this? When did Jesus become aware of it? Some theologians speculate that it was when Jesus entered the temple that he became aware, essentially, of the mission that he had. Others speculate that it was at some point when he engaged in his mission, which lasted, as much theologians would say, probably three to three and a half years before he was crucified. But what we do know is this. We know that Jesus was definitely aware of his mission at the transfiguration, because when he speaks to the apostles, he mentions to them what? What his destiny is. And so at some point we realize Jesus humanly, while being fully God, becomes aware of his mission. But uh, interestingly enough, we also know eternally, as Jesus has eternally existed, Jesus has known his mission. And that mission is to be our savior so that we as sinners might have eternal life through his sacrifice. And friends, that's what we rejoice in. We rejoice in the blessedness of being sinners saved by a Savior. We rejoice in the fact that Christ was willing to come to this earth to die upon a cross so that we might have eternal life. Billy Graham says this, the very purpose of Christ's coming into the world was that he might offer up his life as a sacrifice for the sins of men or mankind. He came to die. This is the heart of Christmas. Think about that for a minute. You know, I've often reflected, and this is one of the things that I think as being a father, um, you uh, realize more and more um, as you emotionally move into this, and this is just me talking. But what I think about when I look at my children, and we'll just take, I'm going to take Parker because he's my firstborn, okay? This theologically, I don't call it heresy, right? I'm just giving you an emotional aspect of what I wonder God was thinking, I can't imagine the deep love of God to turn to his son and to say, son, I have a mission for you. Go make me proud. And the son turning to the father and saying, father, I want to make you proud. And the father saying, son, the mission is this. You're going to go to a cross and be beaten and scorned and mocked and ridiculed and rejected by the people whom you love. You're not going to do anything wrong. You're going to do everything right. But you're going to go there so that these people who profess their love to you because they think they're going to get something temporal are going to ultimately reject you because of who you are. 
but your great love for them is what's going to deliver them to the great love that we have for you. Go make me proud, son. Go do your thing. Go to the world. Be born on a mission. I can't imagine that deep love. But friends, that's the love of God that he has given to us so that we might have eternal life through him. And we read in scriptures that when we didn't love him, he first loved us. That's Christmas. That's the blessedness that we have. I want to leave you with this. The take-home truth is simply this, this aspect. Promised by God, don't ever forget this, promised by God, Christ the infant babe enters the world on a mission. And that mission is to bring salvation. But that salvation will be through his sacrifice. That's gospel. That's Christmas. That's Jesus. That's joy. That's love. That's hope. That's peace. That's what we celebrate during Advent. I want to take a minute. And what I'd like to do um, is this. I want you to think about the blessedness of the joy that we have through Jesus Christ. And to do that, I, uh, have, I'm gonna, we're going to play a song. It's kind of one uh, that... Kind of a favorite of mine. Uh, it's Children Again by Jason Gray. What I want you to do during this time is just as the words are played, just read them, look at them, and reflect on them in what it means to have a Savior and the blessedness of an infant babe that can make us become children again to be renewed, to be restored, and to be blessed through a spiritual rebirth of which we now share an eternal inheritance with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, where we need no longer fear death nor pain, where we realize that indeed, no matter what happens in this world, our hope is secure through the infant babe. Pray during this time. Let God speak to you. I pray that the song maybe speaks to your heart um, and it just kind of solidifies what we're speaking about today. Christmas is calling
For you this morning, we just thank you for you, and it does sound crazy that a baby can make us all children again. Father, what good comes out of Bethlehem while our Messiah comes out of Bethlehem? And Lord, may we never forget the joy of Christmas, the blessedness of an infant babe who comes to save his people, to redeem his people from their sins. Lord, I pray that as we look at Christmas, we take time not only to reflect on the birth of Christ but we would also recognize that with the birth of Christ comes the cross of Christ. The two cannot be separated from one another. But out of the cross of Christ comes the death of Christ. And out of the death of Christ comes the resurrection of Christ. And out of the resurrection of Christ comes the triumph of, of sin, uh, over sin and death. And Lord, in that we can place our faith and trust in Jesus and become adopted sons and daughters of a living king, heirs of the kingdom and the promise that God gives. And Father, may we recognize too, just as was prophesied by Micah centuries earlier and forgotten about by God's people, that the infant babe came just as God had promised in Bethlehem. And Lord, as we reflect and look to the second coming of Christ, may we realize that indeed God has promised it. And so may that bring us hope and rest and peace during this time as we reflect on Christmas. May peace come realizing that indeed God's kingdom is and, be, and is established, is being established, and will be established. And there is no doubt because the sovereign God has said so. May that bring peace and rest and comfort to our souls. We pray these things in your name, dear Jesus, and we ask it all by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And God's people say, amen. <laughs>